Good evening and welcome to this Nunc Leakit Bible study. Our topic tonight is Seeing the Horses and Chariots of Fire. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your word is not like any other book, not like any other book, not like any other book. We pray that you open our eyes, Lord God, to see you in the book. Open our eyes. Show us how, the, how we may have our eyes open so that we too may see the horses and chariots of fire. Amen. Be seated, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and joining us on the phone and online and so on. Always a blessing. Always a blessing. Uh, let's see. They, they, uh, seeing the horses and chariots of fire. We've been doing a series of, um, uh, just a brief series. This is the fifth in the series. Of, uh, on Wednesday nights of looking at specific correspondences. Swedenborg says that scripture is written in this language of correspondences. It's more than mere symbolism. It really is that something physical embodies something spiritual and vice versa. They both have the same value in the, in the two different worlds and so on. And <clears throat> part of the purpose in looking at this, one thing that I'm hoping will happen for you is that <laughs> As you read devotionally and so on, you will bump into these images. I've certainly found it myself after we looked at figs and grapes and olives and looking last week at salt and so on, that as you're reading, you, you bump into these images in, in unlikely places. And, and it just blesses me a little bit to have it reinforced. And, no, this, is, this all has a spiritual meaning. Uh, and so tonight we're looking at horses and chariots. And, and what exactly horses and chariots mean, and what, what scripture is doing in talking about them. And um, one of the things that I find myself uh, arrayed against, is not that I'm against any individual who believes this, but I think that biblical literalism, in other words, the idea that the Bible just simply means what it says and says what it means, is actually a rather impoverished view. And it's a view that does not readily lend itself uh, to spiritual work, to repentance, to turning inward and seeing how we need to change and, and, and so on. Uh, yes, there are some, uh, some commandments and, and some literal things, but, but uh, I think that has become in some ways a sort of politicized view and um, it, it's kind of understandable in a way. It's amazing how that view almost surrounds itself with this sense of like, this is the right way to look at it. Everything else is sort of soft and fuzzy, or, or it's, you know, somehow like you're just making things up or something. Uh, but that's not the way that it is. Uh, and we'll be looking at that specifically through the imagery of horses tonight. Um, I wanted to start with that story that I alluded to just now. So if you can turn in the Old Testament to the second book of Kings, uh, chapter 6. Second book of Kings, chapter 6. There's a vision. And so part of what I will be asking tonight, uh, along with the meaning of horses and chariots, is uh, one view would be that horses in Scripture mean, hello, horses, the four-footed animal, you know? And the chariots mean chariots, i.e. things that you pull behind a horse in order to go into war or for whatever reason, you know, for transportation and so on. And so let's look at that notion that that just literally means a horse and a chariot, because I think you'll find some ways in which scripture undermines that. And I'm fascinated that scripture will literally undermine a literal reading. Uh, so let's look at second book of Kings, chapter 6, uh, verse 17. I'll just set this up a little bit. They, uh, Elisha was the man of God. He was a prophet. And uh, they were surrounded by enemies, and Elisha's servant, Gehazi, was terrified by this circumstance. You're probably familiar with this story. There was a whole movie made out of this, this uh, term that comes up in here. So verse 17, if you will. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses chariots of fire all around Elisha. Hmm. It's interesting that they were all around Elisha, isn't it? Uh, and, and the verse just before that says, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. 
we, we have a larger force. And then this idea of opening the eyes. If you have a strictly literal view of Scripture, what does opening the eyes mean? Because what goes on here is that Gehazi is terrified, and then he has his eyes open, and he sees these horses and chariots of fire. After his eyes were opened, now, uh, you could set a wooden chariot on fire. You have, I don't know what would happen if you set a horse on fire. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know what that would look like. Um, but I don't think that's what he was seeing. I don't, think he, I don't think the horses were screaming and upset because they were on fire. You know, he saw horses and chariots of fire. This was some spiritual vision of these good forces, forces from heaven, that were surrounding and helping uh, the cause and so on. And the only way that he could see them, first of all, he was in fear. And then uh, the Lord opened his eyes and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And so part of what I want to talk about tonight is, is it possible for us to have our eyes open and to see horses and chariots of fire and what would be required in order to have that experience? And we'll just sneak around and look at that in various different ways. I won't go straight in the front door on that. Um, uh, the second scripture that I want to look at, uh, <clears throat> see, his eyes were open. Uh, let's turn to the Gospel of John in the New Testament, if you will, the fourth of those Gospels. And I want to turn first to chapter 3, because I just want to emphasize something. I just want to emphasize something. Because of this way of looking at Scripture that is that it's all about, you know, the Scripture is to be taken literally, and it's about literal things in this world. There's a reading of the book of Revelation that it's all about, you know, the ancient Roman kings or, or whatever, you know, it's just about stuff in this world. So let's look, this really struck me the other day. This is Jesus, uh, John chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, and let's start at verse 5, we can't help that. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and asked him, uh, and they got into the conversation about being born again. Verses 5 and 6, my good friend. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Hmm, water and the Spirit. And then what does he say in verse 6 there? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Hmm, I think that's very striking. In other words, the, the text is literally saying that there are two things. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. And what's born in the flesh is flesh. You know, there are people, there are lots of Christians in this world. Uh, again, I'm not knocking them individually or whatever, but I think this teaching is not good. But that believe that, that going down into physical water the first day that you're a Christian washes away your sins. It's an amazing idea. That physical water could wash away your sins. When it says right here, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The physical water, he says you have to be born of water and of the spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So there's flesh and there's spirit. There's two different things. It, it, you shouldn't even have to say it. And yet this world is full of people who are looking at these texts in a very flat external way. You know? Turn to John 4, next chapter. Uh, verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Oh, hmm. must worship in spirit and in truth, not in flesh. I mean, it doesn't say you shouldn't worship in the flesh, but somehow God is spirit. God is spirit. Hmm. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And turn to John 6, 63, for another little statement about spirit and flesh. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Whoa. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Hmm. The words I speak to you are spirit. They're not flesh. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. He just said the flesh profits nothing. So his words are not flesh. He's not talking about flesh. It, I, I just thought it was important to get that out of the way at the beginning. You just say there's a difference between the spirit and the flesh. And what, when Elisha's servant had his eyes opened, he's not seeing flesh horses and flesh chariots that are afflicted with a fleshly fire. He's seeing spiritual horses and spiritual chariots that are spiritually on fire. 
And because his eyes were open, that's what eyes open mean. You know, that he, the, his eyes were open and he could see these things in, in a different light. And I'm hoping that that will happen to us tonight and we'll have some sense of, of what that is. So let's look at the meaning of horses and chariots to try to get an idea. And I want to give you a little, uh, uh, I, let's, let me just set this up by saying, I, I started this with a study of horses. And then they were constantly hanging around with chariots in, in the text. And I was very interested in that. And, um, and uh, we will see that there are things said of chariots. Chariots and horses in, in our physical world, in the fleshly world, a fleshly horse and a fleshly chariot. A fleshly horse is an animal. I know that surprises you. It comes from a mommy animal and a daddy animal. That's how you get a horse. Whereas a chariot is made by people. They just bang it together out of whatever, try to make it as light as they possibly can. So, would it interest you to know, good friends, as we may see tonight, depending on the translation that you've got in front of you, that in Scripture, people are invited to eat chariots. But it's surprising to know that the, the chariots are said to be put to the sword. Chariots are said to rage, rage, O oh, chariots. Uh, so the things that are said about, and the Lord is said to cast horses and chariots into a deep sleep. So there are things said about horses and chariots. The, the people are told to eat horses and chariots. They're told to put horses and chariots to the sword. The, the, the Lord puts horses and chariots into a deep sleep. These are not physical, like it doesn't work. You know, whoever's trying to read this literally, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, and, and so let's see this. In fact, some of the translators, you may run into this in your translation, uh, that some translators couldn't abide the thought of eating chariots and they changed it to charioteers, just to make it cannibalistic, because that was at least a step up from eating a chariot. You know? Um, but and so you may see some changes in the translation there, but most of the readings in the parallel Bibles, and certainly what the Hebrew says, you know, is about eating chariots and so on. But first of all, why don't we cut to the chase and find out what these things mean? And for that, let's turn, good friends, to the book of Job, a very ancient book, full of correspondences. So Job is in your Old Testament and comes before the Psalms. And let's look at Job chapter 39. Now, hmm. all right. All right, we're going to start at verse 17, Job 39, verse 17. We're going to read a little bit because it's about Trump. That's, but the first two verses are what we're going to focus on here. Just so keep your thinking cap on. There's a tendency that we all have as human beings, particularly in the face of Scripture, but it happens with other reading as well. Uh, where uh, as soon as the words start to flow over, you shut off the intellect. You know, but try to keep the intellect engaged, all right? Okay, go ahead. Because God deprived her of wisdom. Of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Because God deprived her, whoever it was this, of wisdom. And did not endow her with understanding. With understanding. Wisdom. Because God deprived her of wisdom and did not under, impart under her understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she scores the horse and its rider. The horse, wisdom and understanding, the horse and its rider. Wisdom and understanding, the horse and its rider. And, and, and I think it's a flip-flop, it's a chiasm, you know, uh, where the wisdom means the rider and the understanding means the horse. The horse means the understanding, and the rider means wisdom. It's one of the clearest passages of this type here. And uh, that may not be saying much. But, uh, but you get wisdom and understanding right there with horse and rider. And when you think about it, what an understanding would be, doesn't it make sense that wisdom would ride an understanding? In other words, you'd have a certain understanding of something, you'd have a certain approach to it, and then that might lead you, if you rode that, that would lead you to wisdom, you know, as you put that thing into life, or something. And that is indeed what Swedenborg says that these things mean, 
uh, that the wisdom would be the rider and the horse would mean understanding. And specifically, Swedenborg says it means of the word, of the very book that we're, we're reading here. Understanding and, and wisdom is what rides it. Uh, another little fun bit that you will see as we do these passages is that in general, like with a chariot, you try to make the chariot as light as possible. Uh, what, the way this evolved was, that first of all, you'd have horses, and then people would ride the horses, and they were powerful in a military situation because you could, you know, you could move more quickly, you could move in, you could go in with a bow and arrow, but the problem was you could only carry so many arrows at a given time, and you didn't have much flexibility because the horse kind of got in the way, so you'd have to have a small bow that wasn't very powerful and so on. Whereas if you've got a chariot, you could stand up in the chariot with a much longer bow, you got a smoother ride, you're not trying to, you know, <laughs> shoot like this, and, and uh, so you can get a better shot off provided the, the terrain is right, for, for what you're doing. And so it was a powerful weapon of war. It was only used in, I mean, it's a long time, but still, it was only used in war from 2000 to 1000 BC. So even in the time of the prophets, when some of the prophets were writing, they had already gone out of style. Because people figured out, oh, just throw a spear at the horse. You know, so they figured out how to deal with that problem. And um, after that, chariots were used for races, for the Olympics, and so on. And then they went out of style. And we'll see in some of these quotes that we're coming up on uh, that uh, it's predicted that at the, uh, in those days, this amazing future moment, chariots will be involved. Uh, so, we better keep some chariots around to literally fulfill those promises. Um, let's look at uh, some scriptures about forces and see if we can come to some understanding. Um, let's turn back to Exodus, all right? We'll go roughly in chronological order, I mean, book order, I should say, through the scripture here. So in Exodus 14, um, hmm, let's see, well, let's just read uh, verses 26 to 28. Okay, this is, this is uh, when the children of Israel, all the plagues have happened and everything, and they escape from the land of Egypt, and then Pharaoh comes after them. And they go into the Red Sea, and this is what happens. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots, hmm. on their horsemen. Hmm, interesting. I, I just find, you know, I, I can't argue it very persuasively at all, uh, but I just find it curious to say Egyptians, chariots, and, and horsemen in that order is just interesting, isn't it? Go ahead. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. So it's interesting that the chariots were destroyed, as, you know, the text goes out of its way to specify it's not just the horsemen, it was the chariots of Egypt that were destroyed. And then, the first real piece of music that you hear in the Old Testament comes after this destruction, when they got free. After this destruction, first of all, Moses and the children of Israel sing a song, and then Miriam, his sister, sing a song. And let's just read the first verses of both of those songs. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1, right there in Exodus. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. It's sort of an odd order to say it in. Um, I mean, I guess it works that way, but you generally think of the rider, that the rider is more important than the horse. And it says the horse and the rider he threw into the sea. And look at verse 21. Miriam answered with a song. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Mm, there you go. Um, so what what this has to, you know, we, we, we can't go explaining all the, the details of it, but uh, 
the chariots, the meaning of a chariot is a doctrine or what you might call a body of teaching. Yeah, everybody's reading the same book. Everybody's reading the same Bible. I'm not saying everybody, but all Christians who are reading the Old New Testaments are reading more or less the same uh, Old New Testament. Uh, Jews reading Hebrew Scriptures are reading the same Old Testament and so on, uh, Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, and yet they have very different perspectives. You know, you'll get one person who'll say, well, I read the book, and what I get is that there are three persons of the Godhead, salvation is instantaneous, it's on the basis of faith alone, Ten Commandments are done away with, there's nothing you have to do, and so on. You know, they'll have a whole list. That's the chariot. Like they had an understanding of the word, and then they have their human-made chariot, which is like, this is my understanding of how that works. Whereas someone else could go in and say, oh no, I read the same book, you know, I was trying to get an understanding of that same book myself, but the chariot I came up with was that there's one God who has three aspects. Uh, salvation is not instantaneous. You need to repent. The Ten Commandments are not done away with, and so on. So, you know, you get an entirely actually opposite chariot, uh, you know, by reading the same book. And so the chariot's an important piece of it, uh, because the chariot's what you put together in your understanding, and what, you know, what, what whole groups of people, what whole churches put together in terms of their understanding and their view. And so it's interesting that the, and you'll often find in Scripture that horses and Egypt go together. It's fascinating. But we'll see that Egypt comes up a number of times, and there's a number of different things that uh, Egypt means. It can mean a sort of purely academic approach and so forth. But generally, it's just an external uh, reading, external view, uh, from your own intelligence kind of thing is what it means and so here I think that's why it's important that the horse like the understanding of the word went south and the wisdom went with it you know, that's why I would say the horse first and I'd say the horse and the rider were thrown into the sea because it, it does go in that order spiritually it may not go in that order physically um, it's all abundantly clear isn't it um, all right, uh, let's look at um, 2 Kings chapter 2. So we turn to the right, flip through a few books, and you'll get to 2 Kings. And I was interested that the horses and chariots of fire were around Elisha. It's really interesting. Interesting. So here in 2 Kings chapter 2, Verses 11 to 12, what do we find here? Uh, so Elisha and Elijah are having a conversation. Elijah was, the, was a prophet, and Elisha was his successor kind of thing. And they had a time of overlap. Go ahead. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared hmm. with horses of fire oh. and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Mm. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Okay. So there's another chariot of fire, and more horses of fire that carry Elijah right up into heaven, just in the world. And whoa, they're just having a conversation. Whoa, there it goes. And Elisha saw it. And what does he cry out? My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Do the Israelis have really special chariots? Interesting. This chariot of fire is said to be the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Interesting, interesting. interesting. And this is, this is a, a chariot and a horse of fire that's taken up into heaven. So, just to take a, a, um, a shot of what this might mean, uh, the fire would have to do with the highest level of understanding of the word and the highest level of the body of teaching, which would be shot through with love, love for the Lord, love for the neighbor. You know, 
the Lord's love for the whole human race and so on. And that's what I think that a chariot of fire means. Both Elijah and Elisha, we're told by Swedenborg, mean the Lord as to the word, and that rather baffling phrase that Swedenborg is fond of using. Uh, in other words, they, they are the Lord in his role as the word. And so Elijah goes up in this whirlwind into heaven in a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Hmm. Okay, so that's, that doesn't sound like, again, it doesn't sound like a literal, literal uh, horse or chariot. Okay. Oh, let's look at chapter 13 in the same book. Really quick. Chapter 13, verse 14. And this is the death of Elisha. So we just saw the death of Elijah. And when Elijah died, he said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof. And Elisha died. Okay? Elijah had become sick with the illness of which he was dying. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Sorry. Like there wasn't even a chariot or a horse involved in this story. And then he says exactly the same thing that Elisha said before when Elijah was there. Curious, isn't it? Curious. Why would you blurt that out? You know, it's not, <laughs> even hospice workers don't hear that much. They blurt that out at deathbeds, you know. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel, the horsemen thereof. Okay. Okay, let's uh, go to Psalm 20, verse 7. We're just investigating what this means. Psalm 20, so that's to, to the right. There, a beautiful, you know, familiar sort of phrase to many of you, I'm sure. Hmm. It takes on a different meaning when you see that, when, when you, you, we read before, that this was understanding, this is wisdom. Right? It said it very clearly. You know, the horse and the rider. Uh, go ahead. From the beginning? No, verse 7. Oh, you. sorry. No, no. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Wow. So salvation, here we've seen a couple of people died, and there was mention of horses and chariots and so forth. And then here's some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. All right, I just want to write the word name up here somewhere. I didn't put anything on the board last week, so i got to make up for it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we'll trust in the name of the Lord. All right, so we'll remember that. It's a fun little passage. But in other words, so you could just think of that in an external way that some people trust in little chariots or something or, or horses, you know, military strength or something like that. But what if it means some put their trust in doctrine? you know, a body of teaching, or some trust that they are understanding the word, but we're going to look to those divine qualities of the Lord, you know, that love and wisdom of the Lord, and that's what we'll put our trust in, not in these things alone, you know, in the, in, independent of what the Lord is doing. Uh, oh, let's look at Psalm 32. This is a fun one. Some of this I came by just, you know, crawling through under passages about horses. There are many, many, you know, we're not looking at anything like every passage on the horse. The horses come up a lot in Scripture, a lot, a lot, a lot. And in verses 8 and 9, hmm, okay, oh, and um, I need to put the word I up here, too, because it wasn't the case that the servant had his eyes open and he saw the horses and chariots of fire. Okay, so let's just put the word I up there. And if you read verses 8 and 9. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Okay. Do not be like a horse or like a mule, which have no understanding. Oh. <laughs> which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Now, does that mean 
don't be like a horse or a mule because they have no understanding. Or does that mean, don't be like a horse or a mule that has no understanding. Be like a horse and a mule that does have an understanding. You know? Because uh, we saw in that other passage that a horse had something to do with, with uh, understanding. And I'm going to write the word bridle up here. Bit and the bridle. Hmm. It's, it, doesn't it suggest at the end of the verse there that you need a bit and a bridle to, to control them? You know, the mouth must be held in and so forth. Something about controlling the horse. And so isn't that interesting? I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which you should go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Don't be as a horse and as a mule which have no understanding. Mm. It's, it's, it seems multi-layered to me. All right. Uh, let's look in uh, Psalm 45. There's a fun little passage in here that I want to refer back to later on. This doesn't actually have to do with horses, but it tells you how to ride. Mm, okay. Psalm 45, verses... Uh, so three and four, let's say. Gird your sword upon your thigh, Almighty One. Okay, I'm going to write the word sword up here because I just, you know, can't resist. All right, sword. <laughs> Gird your sword on your thigh. Oh, I'm going to write the word thigh up here. All right. With your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty, ride prosperously because of truth, truth, humility, humility, and righteousness. Righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. All right. Gird your sword on your thigh, O most mighty. With your glory in your majesty. In your majesty, ride prosperously. What does it say in here? Same, right. same word. Because of three things. Because of truth. And humility, or in the Old King James, says meekness and righteousness. Truth and meekness and righteousness. Okay, so riding. Uh, truth, humility, righteousness. Hmm. I've just gotten past the point where I can really read these things literally anymore. I, I just think the, um, you know, to speak of God, isn't it talking about God? You most mighty with your glory and your majesty? It's talking about God, right? God is going to ride. Hmm. Let me ask you, how big is God? <laughs> Bigger than most horses. You're going to need a big horse, right? Like it's well known that if you're infinite, you need an infinite horse. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you fall off. It's, it's typical. Okay, so God is going to be riding with these qualities. Truth and humility and righteousness. All right? File that away in mind. Turn to Psalm 76. This is one of my favorites. All right? Psalm 76. Don't say I didn't tell you. All right, uh, 76 verse 6, I don't know what it'll say in your translation, good friend, but I'm sure what it says mine. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. There you go. Did I lie to you? I did not lie. It says, at your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse are cast into a dead sleep. Now that word both is um, curious there because in our physical world those are two entirely different types of being, one of which is subject to sleep, although it does still stand up from what I understand, and another one which doesn't sleep at all, it's about as unconscious as you probably, probably get from the day one, right? At your rebuke, both of these were cast into a dead sleep. Now does anyone here have a translation where they change it to charioteer? This is both rider and horse lay stunned. Yes, rider. Okay, right. Yeah, because there are some translators who, who couldn't abide the thought of a chariot falling asleep. And so, they, you know, I mean, the Hebrew is very clear, but they would change the wording. You know, I understand. I'm a translator. I, I understand that. You want it to make sense and so on. 
but that's not what it says. It says that your rebuke now to me, first of all, I put myself in God's shoes. I'm not really that mad at horses. <laughs> I don't go fuming about, you know, it's not like a pet peeve at the dinner table. Oh, it's horses. <laughs> Does God really have to rebuke the horse community? I mean, they're noble creatures. They're beautiful, right? That's your rebuke of God, Jacob, both the chariot, let alone the chariot. I mean, yes, the chariots have a tongue. But uh, both the chariot and the horse are cast into a dead sleep. Hmm. See, a physical... Horse and a physical chariot. A physical chariot cannot be cast into a physical sleep. But a spiritual chariot, a body of teaching, can that be asleep? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, can it be something where the eyes are not open? Like you're not seeing the horses and chariots of fire. The horses and chariots are cast into a dead, you know. They're, they're no good. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a no good understanding. It's not a good body of teaching and so on. It's, it's in a deep sleep. And you must know by now, good friends, that, that so often in Scripture, when it says God does these nasty things, you know, it means that the presence of, in the presence of the Lord, this is the reaction. You know, when the Lord comes, that body of teaching, or whatever, turns out to be fast asleep. But that's what it really means in the inner me. But I just love that, because that is a pretty tough passage to me, literally. <laughs> no, that's just a tough one. It's a tough one. All right, uh, oh, let's uh, turn to Psalm 147 for our last little taste of the Psalms tonight. 147, oh, we might have to read verses 5 all the way down to 15. Can you do it? You think you can do it? All right, okay. 5 to 15. Great is our Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding, his understanding is infinite. Mm, his understanding is infinite. Well, if you're an infinite God and you need an infinite horse to ride on, an infinite understanding would be a good horse, wouldn't it? It would make a suitable horse. Go ahead. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Oh, how do you ride? It's through humility and righteousness. So there's humility involved in this ride. Okay? Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountain. Just take all that literally. Go on. He gives to the beast its food, and to the young ravens <laughs> okay. that, that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. Hmm. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. Now that's a similar sentiment, isn't it? We've already seen another sentiment that was like that. You know, don't trust in the horse or the chariot, but in the name of the Lord. So, right? Go on. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. Sure, that means literally. Just more iron or something. Go on. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. And fills you with the finest food. That's just talking about food. Go on. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. Oh, his word runs. Hmm, in a horse passage, we have the word running very swiftly. Hmm. He sends forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runs very swiftly. Hmm. Okay, so there's a passage about understanding and clouds, and he doesn't delight in the strength of the horse. Hmm. All right? Good. Everything is literal, nothing to see there. All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> Isaiah chapter 31. So if you keep going to the right through Proverbs and Ecclesiastes on the Psalm, you get to Isaiah. And we look at Isaiah chapter 31. All right. And we'll read verses 1 to 3. That's another fun passage. All right. Woe to those who go down to Egypt. To what? Those who go down to Egypt. Those who go down to Egypt. Okay, down to Egypt. Woe to those who go down to Egypt. 
probably doesn't mean that that literally is a bad country. It's about what Egypt stands for. Okay? Go to Egypt for help and rely on horses. Oh. Who trust in chariots oh. because they are many. And in horsemen because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek the Lord. Look at that. Is that the same thing? Now, isn't it bizarre? I was only trying to see the horses, officer. I really wasn't trying to see all this stuff about looking to God. But here it is, you can't get up in horse passages, and it keeps talking to you. Don't put trust in this or this. Look to this up here. You know? Have we seen that several times? Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, go on. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. All right. And their horses are flesh and not spirit. Oh, now that's, we got to pause there for a second. I mean, I didn't expect their horses to be spirit, frankly. This is a slam against the Egyptians, that they're men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit? What is going on in here? It's a slam, isn't it? Like their horses were supposed to be spirit. They were not supposed to be flesh. Flesh and spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. It's the spirit. Didn't we read that? We just read it, right? Hmm. Okay, you can finish off the verse. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helped will fall, and he who has helped will fall down. Look at that. Here's all oh, perish together. Sorry, there we go. All perish together. That's right. So I am really fascinated in that statement. The Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. And it literally says that. It literally says right there that the problem with your average Egyptian is that their horses are flesh yeah. and not spirit, because they ought to be spirit. Well, that makes no sense in a literal way, but if you think it, about it as Egypt being an external reading, uh, sort of a godless, just you know, secular reading or something like that, and then you say they're, they're, they're men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. Like this, your understanding of the word is supposed to be spirit. That horse is supposed to be spirit. And it's a shame when it's just, what, your horse is just flesh? You know? Because it wasn't supposed to be that way. Your understanding is supposed to be spiritual. Because if God is a spirit, those who worship him must worship him in the spirit and in flesh. My words, the words that I speak to you, are spirit and they are life. So having a flesh horse is not what you're looking for. Good, we know that when we're shopping for horses. We'll keep that in mind. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. I just like this image. Um, Isaiah chapter 63, uh, let's, verses 10 to 14. But they rebelled. This is about the children of Israel and their relationship to God and so on. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Mm. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Hmm. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, mm. who led them by the right hand of Moses, with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name? So there's the parting of the Red Sea, which we read about before, right? Divided the water before them. Who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they might not stumble. Isn't that neat? You have to get a little horse sensitized. Passages like this take on a different meaning. They were led like a horse in the wilderness. You know, that their understanding was being brought along. We'll go ahead with verse 14. As a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious mm. Yeah, so just, just interesting that it was like in the children of Israel, to a horse in the wilderness. 
Um, well, let's look at verse 66, uh, chapter 66, I'm sorry. And um, I'm thinking about verses 18 to 22. I just wanted to point out uh, that this is about the end of times that Scripture is often talking about. Mm -hmm. And it says, you know, in verse 18, I will gather all the nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And in verse 20, they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots, and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem. At the time that this was written, chariots had already gone seriously out of stock. That was, you know, 3,000 years ago. They were already yesterday, you know. <laughs> Do not use after such and such a date. And um, and yet, here's this prediction of the end of times that people, will, well, if people are going to take all these other predictions literally, we better start making the charts. Right? Because that's how everybody's going to come. But if this is non literal then the Lord bringing people on horses and in chariots has to do with this. has to do with their understanding. That's how he's going to come. It's the same thing that starts him right now as he's coming in the clouds of heaven, which is the clouds of scripture. You know, it, it's, it's an understanding is how he's going to come. All right, uh, let's move right along, move right along. Uh, Jeremiah, which is the next one to your right, chapter 46. Verses 8 and 9. Another forced passage. Egypt rises up like a flood, and its water... What is it with Egypt? Egypt? Every time I go looking for a horse passage, Egypt is hanging around. What's <laughs> going on? Okay. Its waters move like the rivers. And he says, I will go up and cover the earth. Mm. I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. Come up, O horses, and rage, O chariots. There it is. Did I say he was going to command the chariots to rage? Okay. Yeah. Really go on a tear, chariots. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. And let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Lydians who handle the shield, and the Lydians who handle and bend the bow. Bow. Okay. I'll just put the word bow up there. Okay? Handle the bow. Okay. So again, you know, commanding chariots to rage, a little bizarre. Uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 50. Verses 35. Hmm. Yeah. This is just a fun reading. Let's just enjoy it. 35 to 40, how about that? This is a feel good reading. <laughs> A sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon, and against her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers, and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, and they will be dismayed. A sword is against their horses. Makes sense. Against their chariots. Does not make sense. And against all the mixed peoples who are in her midst, and they will become like women. Don't be offended. <laughs> A sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. And we, yeah, it, it mentions in verse 40 about overthrowing Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. Uh, you know, again, this idea that at the end of times, that a sword is going to come on the horses and the chariots, I can understand hitting a horse with a sword, but I don't know what would be gained by hitting a chariot with a sword. Uh, but I may be reading that too literally. And, uh, okay, next chapter, chapter 51, verses 20 to 23. Okay, here's another field of passage. Go ahead. You are my battle axe and weapons of war. Oh, yes. For with you I will break the nation in pieces. With you I will destroy kingdoms. With you I will break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. Okay, let's hold on for a second. Now we need to look at the physics of it. See, uh, you have a horse. You can get some horse, the horse to do some work for you. Or you can ride 
the horse. Or you can get a chariot, in which case you can ride in comfort in the chariot. Generally speaking, you don't have a horse and a rider and a chariot and a rider. Too many riders. I mean, you should get, you know, they look stupid, right? <laughs> you know, a rider here, a couple of riders, you know, that's not how it's done. It's not how it's done. And yet there it is, right? So the breaking piece of the horse and his rider and the chariot and his rider is as they were two e equivalent things. Now, physically, literally, that makes no sense. In the flesh, it makes no sense. But in the spirit, it makes sense when you understand that a horse, the rider on the horse is wisdom. Well, you can have riders on this, too, right? But lots of people ride on the body of teaching that they've been given in the church or whatever. You know, it makes perfect sense spiritually, but it doesn't make sense in a physical way. Um, let's see. Um, okay, Ezekiel chapter 39. So keep turning to the right, and you'll come into Ezekiel there, and we'll go to chapter 39, and we look at verses 17 to 20, I don't know how your translation will read here, but this is another thing about the end of times, I think. Go ahead. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Is that familiar at all? Sacrificial meal called to the great supper and so on, supper of the great God. Okay. And what will we, we be served if we come to this great sacrificial meal? You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are full, mm. and drink blood till you are drunk Yummy. at my sacrificial <laughs> meal, which I am sacrificing for you. You shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, and with all the men of war. So now there's a place where even the New King James couldn't stand. But that, the word is not riders, it's chariots. You shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and with all men of war, said the Lord God. That's, Rekha, that's the same Hebrew word. And, um, but they couldn't stand the idea of eating the chariots, so they turned it into cannibalism, because that was more easy to take. Okay. You shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and with all men of war, and so on. And you see in verse 22, the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forth. So again, there's a prediction about the end of times that we, there will be this feast and we'll be eating horses and chariots. Now, it makes no sense in a literal way. Even the riders is, is a little gross. Um, let's look at, uh, at, keep turning to the right. We go through Daniel. I want to find Nahum, if you can. Okay, it's after Micah and before Habakkuk, which is entirely unhelpful. Um, um, so, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. It's the seventh one. It's a very small. Okay. And, uh, chapter two? Yeah, let's just read the last verse of chapter 2 and the first two verses of chapter 3. Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots and smoke. Sword shall devour your lions. Sword, okay. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain. Great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. This is why scripture is uh, considered uplifting. Um, uh, now, what did you have at the end of verse 2? What, what kind of chariots? Flattering chariots, but there is no comment. What does it say? Bounding or, or, or jolting or something? Yeah, and the old King James are jumping chariots. How about, do you have another word out there? Rattling. Bounding chariots. Bounding, rattling. Yeah. 
They have jumping, prancing horses and jumping chariots in the old King James, which is fun. Um, oh, just a few more of these. Uh, okay, we, we just... Okay, we have to read Habakkuk. So the next book is Habakkuk. Chapter 3. Look at verse 8 there. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? We had that before, didn't we? Something about the rivers. Okay. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Wow, there's God riding horses, the horse, the horses, the riding horses, and chariots of salvation. Mm hmm. Mm. That's a good chariot. I'd like to get me a chariot of salvation. That, that would be good. Uh, if there's a literal chariot, I don't know what people think about that as a literal chariot. Uh, but chariots of salvation, right? Horses and chariots of salvation. Uh, just a couple more phrases. I'm skipping some in here, but they're all fun. Uh, if you turn to Zechariah, which is about three books on, little tiny books, we'll go to chapter 6. There's wonderful stuff in here, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll just go to uh, chapter 6, and let's read the first six verses. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from the king of the mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Hmm. With the first chariot were red horses. Red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. Black, okay, red and black. With the third chariot, white horses. White. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses. Okay. So mm. all mm. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Hmm. And you know in scripture, whenever you ask an angel something, they always give you a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven. Spirits! Four spirits of heaven. So he's having a vision of chariots and horses of different colors, and they're said to be the four spirits. Mm. Horses are spirits. They're four spirits of heaven. Okay? Who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. And then these various different colored horses go off in different directions. Some go to the south, some go to the north, and they walk to and throw them in and so forth. Good, 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 good. Um, Okay, uh, let's turn to the book of Revelation. Very end of the New Testament there. We're going to go to chapter 6, as you can imagine we might. And, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 6, we'll read the first eight verses. Now see, in the context of what we've read here, first of all, to set this up a little bit, um, <coughs> We've seen a lot of talk about horses and chariots, but in a non-fleshly way. In fact, it's been criticized for being fleshly. They should be spirit. They should be the spirits of the heaven. Some of them are on fire, and so forth. And you can put them both to the sword. You can eat them both. You can cast them both into a deep sleep, and, and so on. Uh, so, and, and wisdom is the rider, and the understanding is the horse. And so... Uh, here's a horse passage that's strikingly like what we just saw in Zechariah, but always with a little twist, because it's scripture after all. Uh, so, verses 1 to 8. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder. Oh, and by the way, where is John when he saw these things? Like in chapter 4, verse 1, he says he's in heaven. The door was opened in heaven and so on. He was in the spirit, he says. He saw a throne in heaven in verse 2 there. You know, so he's up in heaven. He's not in the physical world, right? His consciousness is in the spiritual world. He's on the Isle of Patmos having visions, and this is what he sees. Go ahead. Over the four living creatures sing with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. A white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. Had a bow. And a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Hmm. Okay. When he opened the second seal, I heard the 
were saying, come and see. Another voice, fiery red, went back. As it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Sword. Okay. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold a black horse. So we have white and red and black. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. Hades followed with him. Okay, Hades, or in the old King James, hell. Okay, so death is riding the horse in hell. I met a couple of people the other night at a party named Death and Hell. You know, I was a little nervous at first, but they, they turned out to be pretty nice. Uh, no, isn't this bizarre to have death and hell, right? You know, riding on horses? Like, what are you doing on a horse? You know? Go on. Their power was given to them over a fourth of the year to kill with sword, sword. with hunger, with death. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. I think we've got to press on. There are just two more passages I want to read. Uh, Revelation chapter 14. We'll come back to that one. Uh, chapter 14. Okay. And there's an angel who has a sharp sickle toward the end of the chapter. And he said to gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And verse 19 and 20. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the, the winepress was trampled outside the city. And blood came up. And there's blood again. Up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 pounds. There are a number of different ways of expressing depth of blood. Um, you can say yay high, or you can say like four feet, or two and a half cubits, or something like that. Why the bridles of the horses? The bridles of that we read about the bit in the bridle in the song, the thing that steers the horse. Blood came flowing out to the bridles. Isn't that an odd little detail? Do you think scripture just meaninglessly? Yeah, probably just meaningless. Okay. Let's turn to uh, chapter 19. It's probably just meaningless. Uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 11. Oh, gosh, I think we'll have to read all the way down to 21. Go for it. Now I saw it had it open, and he pulled a white horse. A white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges. Oh, we were told that riding was truth, humility, and righteousness. Right? So here he is, he's in righteousness, okay? And he's called faithful and true. He's got truth and righteousness, okay? His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Many crowns. Now, there was a crown before, wasn't there? But now there are many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And I love these sort of details. Okay, so no one knows the name. Keep that in mind. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And, There's blood again. And his name is called the Word of God. Oh, okay. So last verse we didn't know his name, but now his name is the Word of God. Hmm. The Word of God. Horse, the Word of God. Understanding of the Word, okay? And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. White and clean. So they're dressed in white and clean linen, and they're following him on white Horses, okay? Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. We had that treading just a few chapters ago, and it went out to the bridle, you know, the bridle of the horse. And he has on his robe and on his thigh. On his what? Thigh. Thigh. On his thigh. On his robe and on his thigh, okay. A name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So no name, Word of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of 
mighty men, the flesh of horses. There they are. And of those who sit on them. So we have a positive horse, but we see, I don't know whether that's a negative horse or what this is. It's an odd image, all right? And the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And then he sees the beast and they gather to make war against the one who sits on the horse and his army is thrown alive into the lake of fire burning the brimstone. And the sword proceeds out of the mouth of the one who sits on the horse, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh of the remnant that was slain. Um, all right. Uh, all shall be revealed, all shall be made clear. Um, now, it's very interesting that this is some prediction in the book of Revelation at a time a thousand years after chariots uh, were viable. And uh, it, it just uh, it has horses in here mainly. But um, uh, what does it mean, these four horses? So Swedenborg explains these four horses, and I'll just give you a rundown. I'm still trying to grapple with it myself. But basically, what we're being taught is that there are four different ways of understanding Scripture. This is actually a passage about the topic of our Bible studies in general. How do you understand the scripture? And basically, there are four ways to read it. You can read it in a white horse way. And what's the nature of a white horse way? Well, you have a bow. When you read it in a white horse way, you have a bow, and a crown is given to you, and you go forth conquering and to conquer. And that has to do with repentance and fighting against evil. In other words, when you understand, think about what it is to ride a horse. Like you've got an understanding of the word, and then you take that in the direction of wisdom. Riding a horse and using that in order to conquer hell, to conquer some evil. That's a white horse understanding. In other words, you're understanding it truly. That's an inner understanding. It's in the light of heaven. It's white. That's a positive understanding. Because that's the only reading that deals with evil. And that's what the word is designed to do. It's supposed to conquer and to keep on conquering. You know, because once it's conquered, it stays conquered and so forth. And a crown is given to it. And you can see from other scriptures, I can't take you through them right now, uh, but it says, be faithful unto death and you'll be given a crown of life. In other words, that, that's not something that happens the first time you become a Christian, you don't get that crown. Uh, if you've got a crown, you've been conquering some issues in your life. You know, you've been using the word to deal with your evils and things like that. That's a white horse understanding. There's a second type of understanding, which is red. Doesn't Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. And though they be red as crimson, they'll be as white as snow, and that, that type of thing. Um, this has to do with understanding the truth of Scripture, but not using it to deal with evil. Because that sin is still there, that's why it's red. So there's, there's, there's four ways of reading Scripture. You can understand Scripture in a way where you use it to conquer evil, or you can take the truth out of it. You can picture a preacher who, you know, is a good preacher, but has personal problems, you know? Uh, bad things that he does, of, you know, when he's not in the pulpit, or, or this type of, you know. So you've got an understanding of the truth of a kind, but it's married to evil in your heart. You didn't let it deal with your heart. It's a different understanding, a different way of reading. In fact, it's a way of reading that says that the word is not really about what's in my heart. You know, I see this truth and that truth and the other truth and so on. But it's not It's not about me. I, I'm not supposed to do anything. <clears throat> to me, and, and, and some of that, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but some of that literalism smacks to me of this type of understanding where it leaves it alone. It doesn't deal with that evil. Because it doesn't look at it in, in an inner way. How about that third? And what is the effect of that? Well, does this sound familiar? Takes peace away from the earth? You know? You ever experience modern day religion as being an unpeaceful environment? Think there's a few red horses out there? You know? Uh, it takes away the peace because that evil is still there. You know, you're not loving the Lord, you're not loving the neighbor. It, it, it takes away the peace. And the great sword that's given to it is this, is this falsity that fights against the truth. 
Because you may start out in that position. I really think there's a sequence in these. You, you may start out understanding it correctly, but then if you don't deal with the evil, it's a red horse, and then it comes with a sword, and then you've got the third one, which is a black horse, which means there's no truth anymore. You got rid of the truth. Because it's black, it's the opposite of what? And so the black horse is no truth, and what happens in the case of where there's no truth? Because it's the truth that tells you to deal with evil and how to do it. Then wheat is very little value, and barley is very little value. And the Lord takes great care to protect the oil and the wine. But the fact is you have no use for basic good and truth anymore because the, you, you're not even seeing that in you. You're reading the book, but you're riding a black horse. And then the fourth view is where there's absolutely no truth and no love in it whatsoever. You know? It's a dead reading. It's written by a guy named Dad. You know, it's a dead reading. And who follows along behind that type of reading? Hell is that right there because you haven't dealt with the hell. It's only the first horse that knows how to deal with the hell. Those who are conquering and the conquer. You know, rides it forward to deal with that evil and, and, and uh, conquer it. And death and hell comes, and, and that creates all this torment. The hunger has to do with, with lust and so forth, the beasts of the earth, the negative emotions and all that. Uh, that's what destroys you when, when you're in that type of reading. So these are four different ways of reading scripture. Uh, what does the horse's bridle mean in chapter 14? Well, grapes, we already studied about grapes. Grapes have to do with your, your uh, kind acts of charity and goodwill towards others. And so the church is being evaluated to see, are its grapes any good? So they press to see, you know? They press to see, is, is, is there anything there? And what comes out is this great abundance of falsity, all this blood. And how high does that falsity reach? It reaches to the very place that would help you control your horse, like you lose control of your horse. There's so much falsity, you cannot steer that understanding anymore. That's why it goes to the horse's bridle and not to do an half cubits or yay eye or anything else. You know, it's very meaningful that it goes right to that bridle, which is the ability to, to steer, you know, you become unable to steer your horse anymore uh, because there's no life of love towards others. And, and so the, the truth is corrupted by that. And, yes? The fourth horse, you didn't say the color of the horse. Oh, pale. It's pale. And uh, that means it really looks like a corpse, like it looks like a dead horse or something. It just has a pale, sickly pale color because it's absolutely shot. There's, you know, you're much better off with some understanding of truth, but there's still evil in your heart because there's a hope you could get to a white horse state from there. You know, but if it's totally shot, like there's no idea that you have to live it, there's no idea that anything's true about it, the whole thing is just dead, uh, that's bad. Part of the message of Revelation is that there are all these four different kinds of readings out there. It's not, it's not that everybody's riding a dead horse. You know, there's, there's living horses out there of different colors and so on. Uh, but, and in verse uh, 19, I'm uh, chapter 19, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 19, where you see the Lord coming riding on a white horse. Now again, the Lord is infinite. All power has been given to him in heaven and earth. Infinite, omnipresent, omniscient, Omnipotent. How big a horse does he need? He needs that infinite horse. He's riding a horse right here. Was that a literal horse? Does the infinite ride a literal horse? When he was here in the world, he, he rode the uh, donkey and so forth, but we don't know about him riding a horse. But here he is riding a horse. Why would he be riding a horse and why is that a white horse? And the one who sat in was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Well, that, that's the same as conquering, isn't it? How Jesus got to be God was by following, was by riding. You know, we had a Bible study months and months ago about how Jesus, when he was a boy, was a little Bible man. There's evidence in the Bible that he was a little Bible man. He was memorizing scriptures and he knew all that stuff. And he went to the temple and he was asking all those questions. He got there through riding a horse. And he rode a white horse, because he had a true understanding of what it was. And he's called the name of God. And look at those armies which follow behind him. They're on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Uh, could you turn back to Revelation chapter 7 for just a second here? 
<clears throat> chapter 7, verses 9 and 13 and 14, if you could. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, both with white robes, white robes. with palm branches in their hands. Okay, and verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, people greatly misunderstand that statement because they think it means that if you just believe in Jesus and think that he died for you and that's what the blood means in some mystical way, that's how you wash your robe. I'll tell you, friend, that doesn't need to robe clean. It's going to take more than that. Uh, the blood of the Lamb is that divine truth, and by following that divine truth and going through what Titus 3 verse 5 calls the washing of regeneration, you know, that's a process you have to go through, repentance, reformation, and regeneration. That's how you... You wash your robes. That's how you get that white robe. And so, to turn back to 19, they have armies in heaven following him on white horses, and they're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. How did that stuff get clean? Because they repented. You know, they did something about, they let the Lord do something about that evil by repenting. So they're riding on white horses, and what are white horses? They have a true understanding of the word. They're understanding it in an inner way and riding that horse in the direction of, uh, of repentance, getting rid of the evil and so forth, and much more than that. Um, I probably don't have time to go into what all the supper means and eating the flesh of horses and so on, but it has to do with this, uh, benefiting from, from this type of thing. Um, <clears throat> so, all that remains is a simple task of explaining how we see the horses and chariots of fire. How do you see the horses and chariots of fire? See, I think when that horse is going forth, conquering and to conquer, you've got the bow, and you're, and you're conquering that evil because you understand, oh, this is something I have to apply to my life. This is something I have to do. I, have to, I don't just own this thing and keep it <clears throat> stable. You've got to ride it. And when you get on that understanding, that takes and gives you power against that, that hell, you've got a vantage point, everything from up there. You become wise because you're, you're repenting and, and dealing with that. I think in time, that takes you, because it, it's through repentance uh, that we develop love in, in the seven days of creation, as some of you are tired of me saying. Uh, the third day has to do with repentance, and the fourth day, the sun and the moon are born. They have to do with loving the Lord uh, you know, having love and faith in your heart. They come on the fourth day after repentance. Uh, love and faith are things that develop after repentance. How do you become, how do you see a horse and a chariot of fire? You go through that repentance. You follow what the Word says. Apply it to your life. And it takes you into that state of love. Where you're loving, ultimately lo loving the whole human race, loving the neighbor, loving the Lord, and so forth. That's what the horses and chariots, even having your body of teaching, is on fire. Because your body of teaching is all about love. It's not about squabbling. You know, red horses, you've got a church that fights. But a white horse, you're pulling in the same direction. Then you're an army of white horses with fine linen, clean and white. Because you've been dealing with the evil. You're not perfect. Job 15, 15 says that he puts no trust in his saints, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. You don't get totally purified. Where, oh, no, I've never heard of evil. I don't know what that is. No, you're just moving in that positive direction. But you're moving toward love. So in a bizarre way, when we're... I don't know how to describe it. Give me the words, Lord. When you're searching scripture for the meaning of horses, especially if it's something you want to apply to your life, are you not riding a spiritual horse? You know, it's, you see what I mean? It's sort of self-referential. 
like a horse is an understanding of this. So isn't it kind of bizarre that you sit there going, I wonder what the horse means. I wonder what the horse means. I wonder what the horse means. Well, you're riding it. A horse is an understanding of Scripture, you know? And as you apply it, you can have several different types of horses. You can have a horse in which you're interested in the truth, but you really don't want to amend your life, you know? Or you do it for reputation, honor, gain, something else. Or you can have a true understanding where you're applying it to your life and moving forward. Um, and because there's this level of flesh, the Egyptians, they are men and not gods, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. I think that's true in a lot of Christianity today. That the horses are flesh and not spirit. They have a very concrete understanding. They think it's all about, you know, gerrymandering political districts or it has something to do with abortion or some, you know, they, like they're very concrete. I'm not saying those aren't important issues, but I'm just saying that's of this world. Their horses are flesh. They're not spirit. It took the man of God to open the servant's eyes to see the horses and chariots of fire. And where were they? They were all around Elisha, the man of God. When you see that the Lord is at the center of the word, and that he wants to do something for you to lift you out of the hell that you were born into, and so on. That's when you start to understand. I think that's when you start to see that there are horses and chariots of fire. And something that needs to happen in the new church is that we need to get busy with our horses. We've got to get better, myself included, at understanding what we're reading and seeing it in a living way. Swedenborg describes these bizarre circumstances. You probably remember this story. He's, he's somewhere and there's a school with these young, young, uh, they're, I picture them like middle school or something like that. They're you know, probably 12 years old or something like that. And um, you see all these dead horses falling out of the sky and the children are just horrified. And it's because there were some Christians nearby whose concept of the word was just absolutely stone dead. Like they just, no, no life in there whatsoever. And the teacher explained to the, the young children, you know, they were horrified. Man, you know, Master, what is it? And everything like that. He explained, well, see, when you look at Scripture in a totally external way, and you don't look at the essence of it, you know, then you appear, your understanding appears to other people in the spiritual world, and it looks like a dead horse. And they all said, well, we look at it kind of literally. Do we look like dead horses? <laughs> Little sweeties. And the, and the uh, master says, no, no, you're, you're, you're fine. You're young. You know, that's where you start out. You're fine. Um, uh, so in, in the spiritual world, I think about that sometimes when I'm reflecting on the word. And just I just hope and pray that my horse is alive. You know? I want my horse to be alive. I don't want a dead horse. You know? A dead horse is not going to do me or anybody else any good. I want that meditation. You know, may the meditation of my words in my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in my son. You know? I want that horse to be alive. Uh, we've got to have a church with a with a living understanding of the word. I'm not saying we don't have it, but it, but I'm sure we can go farther. We can ride those horses and horses a little farther. We've got to work on our own repentance uh, so that we come to those truths that white clean linen and so on and uh, and so we can see the power of the word when when Elisha's servant looks up when his eyes are open it's because they're in a battle and he thinks the battle is lost you know but when you see the power that's in the word it's the power of the living God when that horse is alive when it's shot through with fire and a chariot of fire. When your understanding of the word is alive, when you're becoming wise as a result of it, when your when you're teaching and your whole approach reflects what you're learning from your understanding. Um, then the individual and the church, the different bodies of the new church and the branches and so on, can become, these can be horses and chariots of a spiritual war. I know some people don't like that metaphor, but that's really what has to happen in terms of heaven. 
There's a lot of hell whooping a lot of people out there, us included. And uh, we need to get a lot stronger. We need to get those horses and chariots of fun. They're still making it. Well, thank you for joining me in this meditation, good friends. Let's close with a break. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the Word. It is written on your thigh, meaning love. It is written on your clothing, meaning truth. You united those perfectly in yourself, Lord. We pray that you, who are the Word, open our eyes. Open our eyes with the servant of Elisha so that we too may see the horses and the chariots of fire that are all around, particularly when we're going through difficult times, Lord, and when we're in that battle with hell. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Keep on repenting, friends. Keep on repenting. <laughs>